Thank you very much for that. Just going to get myself situated here. Just so everybody knows, I am working off a timer today, so I am conscious of the time. Uh, before I get into it today, I just wanted to let you guys know, and uh, just as, by way of a thank you and as a praise item, that yeah, uh, as I've mentioned, we've been in the process of moving here for about 10 months. Um, you're like, what, how much stuff do you have? Uh, but for the past week, we've been receiving a lot of, a, a lot of support uh, for, and acts of service from people in our congregation I just want to say thank you to everyone who's come to help, and thank you to everybody else who has prayed us here. Uh, it's been an incredible blessing and a huge encouragement for us, and we're happy to be with, here with you now. So thank you so much for all the support you've given us as we've been making this, this thing work. This morning, this morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 28 through 30. Uh, and if you have a Bible with you, I want to give you a moment, to, or you can take a moment to, to make your way over there. And as you're doing that, I want to tell you a little bit of a story, or a story that kind of relates to what we're going to be talking about today. Back in December of 2013, back in December of 2013, Nick and I and Evan, this is before Lucy was even a thought, but Nick and I and Evan, we all moved back uh, from Saskatoon back to Alberta. We actually moved to Edmonton. Uh, I'd been the youth pastor out in Saskatoon for a couple of years, but when the senior pastor resigned unexpectedly, it became very clear that we needed to get the heck out of Dodge. So we moved on from there. At the time, I'd not been able to line up another ministry position. We'd left a little bit too hastily to make that work. But my dad, my dad, my dad owns a welding business just outside of Edmonton. And he gave me a job. Now, I'm not a welder. So this was a challenge for him. But he did, to his credit, he did create the position of the unhandy man for me. <laughs> See, at the time, he was building an addition onto his shop so he could expand his business. And, uh, the, and remember, this was in December. Now, the outer walls had been erected. Everything was sort of up around it. But the floor hadn't been laid yet, and the utilities hadn't been brought up into the facility. My first job in the dead of winter, we'd just gotten through Christmas, barely gotten past it, January 1st. My first job in the dead of winter was to dig down through the frozen ground, locate an existing water pipe, and bring it up into the new facility. Easy, right? I'd been teaching the Bible and playing dodgeball for the last two years. I had no idea what I was doing. There's no way that I was doing this on my own. I didn't even know where to start. The ground was frozen solid. How do you get through it? I didn't even know where to start digging, to be perfectly honest. I just knew probably down. <laughs> Thankfully, I wasn't left to figure that out all out on my own. My dad... My dad, he retrained me on the tractor. He has a backhoe out there, and some, for some reason, he trusted me with it. He retrained me on the tractor, brought in some insulated tarps and heaters to thaw the ground out, and he hired somebody to come and flag out where the, approximately where, where the hose was. It was still a hard job. It took a few days to get down there. It took a few days to get it all hooked up and ready to go. It was still a hard job. But it eventually got done because I was given everything that I needed to make it happen. I was given the support and the means to make the job happen. In a similar way, the call to follow Jesus is a difficult thing that no one is equipped to handle on their own. The cost is too high and the work is too much. Last week, we looked at Matthew 10, verses 34 through 38, which I think is one of Jesus' most, most challenging teachings in the gospel. In that passage, he was preparing his followers for the opposition and the rejection that they would absolutely face when he sent them out to preach the gospel. Ultimately, Jesus wanted his followers to know then, and he wants us to know now, that the message of the gospel cannot 
be compromised for any reason. And that is a big responsibility. It's a heavy load to carry and a high price to pay for discipleship. But Jesus, when Jesus was calling people to follow him, he never hid anything about what it would take to follow him. There, was no, there were no hidden fees when it came to Jesus. Jesus never hid any part of what he required from the people he invited to follow him. And that's why it's so important to know that while Jesus demands the highest level of commitment from his followers, he also offers his followers the means to serve him like that. We're not left to our own devices. This is what he says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, if you want to follow along. Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give you is light. With everything that we've talked about so far, what Jesus is saying to his followers in this moment, right here in this passage, is essentially this, that following Jesus is simple. Following Jesus is simple. Now, I don't want to backpedal on anything that Jesus has said so far. I don't want to try and deny any of those hard statements or any of those high demands that Jesus has put on his disciples so far. Being a disciple means committing everything to following Jesus in every part of our lives. God requires the highest level of commitment possible. It requires your whole life. However, Jesus also says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And it's tough to see how both of those things can be true at the same time, where Jesus' burden is light, but the cost of discipleship is my whole life. Which is it? As we unpack this together, I want to make sure that we don't dismiss the cost of discipleship that Jesus has already established, but I think that we'll also see as we walk through this together, I think it'll become clear what it, that what it looks like to follow Jesus is beautifully and mercifully simple. I'm going to take a minute to put this passage into a little bit more context so we can get the whole story of what's going on. So if you want to put this one into context, again, read the entire book of Matthew if you want to get the entire context for what's going on, but we can bring it down just to chapter 11 together. At the beginning of the chapter, we read that after sending his closest disciples out to preach, Jesus goes off and does the same in the surrounding towns. He's uh, working his way around the surrounding towns of Galilee. His cousin, John the Baptist, is in prison at the palace of the local governor. His name is uh, Herod Antipas. Now, Herod had married his sister-in-law, and John had publicly condemned the marriage as illegal and immoral, and so John was put in prison because Herod, Herod didn't like constructive criticism. During his time there, John heard stories about Jesus' ministry. He heard rumors and things that were going on. He heard stories about Jesus' ministry, but the stories he, were hear he was hearing didn't quite match up to what his picture or what his expectation of a messianic ministry would look like. And it made him question a few things about his cousin's true identity. With his confidence shaken and his circumstances grim, John wanted some assurance that this was the Messiah. He wanted some assurance. He just needed some comfort. I'm in prison for this. I need to know for sure. So he sent two of his own followers off to ask Jesus a very direct question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone? Else? Are you the Messiah that we have expected, or are we supposed to still be looking for someone else? You're not what I was expecting, Jesus. You're not what we were expecting. You're not walking around with a giant stick. You're not calling fire and brimstone from the sky everywhere you go. 
And I don't see sinners lamentating on the side of the road anywhere. I don't see them in the wake of the justice that's been served by the Messiah. Are you really the Messiah? Really? You see, John's ministry was very different from Jesus' ministry. And Jesus actually highlights the difference between their two ministries in this chapter. See, John, John was a wild man out in the desert telling people to repent and turn from their sin before judgment fell and it was too late. Some scraggly wild man dressed in fur, looking like a caveman, going around saying, Repent! That isn't in me. That felt very unnatural. <laughs> but that's what it looked like. In all likelihood, he had a picture in his mind of what it would look like when the Messiah arrived. Things would be set back in order by judgment and punishment, and the righteous who had repented of their sin would be rewarded for their piety. That is very likely what John was looking for in a Messiah. In other words, John was expecting someone who would escalate what he'd already been doing. If John was carrying a stick, this Messiah would be carrying a four-by-four. Four. He wanted somebody who was going to escalate what he was already doing. Now, to be clear, Jesus... Jesus' ministry did launch off of John's preaching. And Jesus did escalate what John was doing in his own ministry. He just did it very differently than what John was expecting. Jesus' ministry did bring justice, but not in the way that John and the rest of the religious leaders were kind of thinking that it would look like. Instead of storming in as an unstoppable conqueror, Jesus came as a humble servant. Instead of bringing swift punishment for sin, he offered forgiveness and redemption for the people who suffered under the weight of their sin. And instead of rewarding the pious people who observed the law so fastidiously or so carefully, with such precision and care, Jesus condemned their religion and called them to love God sincerely. This was the mission of the Messiah. And it was totally different than anything the people looking for the Savior had expected because it was so different than what had come before. Jesus' ministry was so different from what had come before. It was simple especially compared to what the people had been taught before. Now, I've talked about the Pharisees in the past. and uh, Sorry, I've talked about uh, who the Pharisees were in the time of Jesus, but just in case you're not quite up to speed, I want to give you a quick refresher just so that we're all on the same page. The Pharisees were a religious faction in Judaism who believed that Israel's restoration could be achieved if the whole law was observed perfectly. They were totally devoted experts in knowing and applying Scripture. If you wanted to go in for a quote off, there's no way that you would ever even come close to these people. They had the entire Scripture memorized, word for word. They were experts in the law. They didn't even develop rules that went above and beyond the law. This developing rules that are above and beyond the law, this is a concept that's called fencing in the law. And it's meant to keep people so far back from the actual law, from actually breaking the law, that they're stopped from sinning before they even get close to it. So for instance, and just as an example, one of God's laws is to rest on the Sabbath day. Observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Rest. Well, to make sure that no one broke God's law, nobody broke God's Sabbath law, the religious leaders actually went so far as to define how many steps you could take on the Sabbath day before you were breaking the law. It's about a kilometer, if you're wondering. And by the way, that's just one rule 
on the Sabbath that they had surrounding the Sabbath law. That's just one rule of many surrounding that one law. And if you think about that and the 613 other laws in the Levitical law, and you think about how there's already 613 laws that we need to keep in mind, and then these other things that sort of fence in each one of those other laws, it becomes, it becomes overwhelming pretty quickly. It's dizzying to think about keeping all that straight, let alone following all of these rules daily. And Jesus calls the religious leaders out, and even John a little bit in this passage, for overcomplicating and overburdening the people. You see, in an attempt to make sure that the people didn't disobey the law, they had lost sight of God's actual desire for their lives. In an attempt to make sure that nobody did anything wrong, in an attempt to protect them from themselves, in an attempt to protect them from God's judgment, in an attempt to try and make themselves good enough for God, they had lost sight of God's actual requirement for their lives. In verse 25, Jesus says that God's desire for people is so simple. It's so simple that even little children can catch it. Little children get it, but it eludes the wise and the learned because they look at God's desire. They look at what God actually desires for their lives, and they actually just think to themselves, it can't possibly be that easy. It can't possibly be that simple. There has to be more to this, and it eludes them. When I turned 16... When I turned 16, I went out and I got my driver's license like many kids do. I'm going to take a side road here and I'm going to say now, now that I'm older and now that I've worked with teens for the better part of a decade, I cannot believe that as a society we let kids that young operate a two-ton battering ram on wheels. I'm not okay with it. I'm, I'm sorry. Something I learned as I was getting my driver's license, and something that I learned early on in my driving career is that the rules of the road, the rules of the road are actually pretty simple. They make it look complicated in those books and stuff, but the rules of the road are actually pretty simple. Stay in the lines, obey the signs, and don't cause anybody else to disobey rules one and two. Obey the signs, stay in the lines, don't cause anybody else to fail those things. Simple. I also learned pretty, that pretty much everyone has their own unique code of conduct the second they get behind the wheel. We have this thing where we know the rules of the road, but we make additions or alterations to it to suit our own driving preferences, myself included. I don't like zipper lanes. We make these additions and these we, we, we add and we subtract from these rules to, to sort of suit our own driving preferences. Some people, some people want to be Mario uh, or whatever his name is, that, that race car driver. Somebody help me out here. I'm not a sports guy. Andretti. It was on the tip of my tongue, I swear. Some people want to be Mario Andretti and they swerve in and out of traffic without signaling. They speed everywhere they go and they're making YouTube videos on their phone the entire time they do it. Some want to make sure they don't even come close to getting a ticket, so they keep their hands firmly bolted at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel without moving a muscle. They drive well below the speed limit, and they plan routes that only involve right-hand turns. Others are so paranoid behind the wheel that they become preoccupied with the other drivers around them, and so much so that they forget to pay attention to what they're doing. They're so paranoid that every ping, every squeak, every rumble throws them into a new and fresh panic attack. Whatever the case is, in all those circumstances where we add and subtract, we do what we want to with the rules of the road, we've actually kind of lost sight of what it is that we're supposed to be doing when we're on the road. 
We've lost sight of the simple rules of the road. Now, that doesn't mean at all. That doesn't mean that driving is a simple thing that we should take casually whenever we get behind the wheel. It is not a casual thing. Every time you get behind the wheel of that car, you have the power to change a life forever if you're not careful. Your life could be changed forever if somebody else is not careful. It's not a casual thing. But the rules of the road, aside from making sure that you maintain your vehicle, making sure that you're taking care of everything, making sure that you're observing your surroundings, all that stuff, the actual rules of the road are very simple. Obey the signs, stay in the lines, don't cause anybody else to fail one or two. In a similar way, the call of Jesus is clear and simple. It doesn't need additions. It doesn't need anything to be taken away from it. The call of Jesus is clear and simple. Like getting in a car, following Jesus has the potential to change our lives and the lives of everyone around us forever. But there are ways that we can lose sight of what it means to follow him, even though following him is actually simple. We can complicate it. We can lose sight of what it is that he's actually calling us to. Here's one way that Jesus is misunderstood in this passage. One way that we commonly misunderstand him. He says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And we need to understand that Jesus is not backpedaling on his earlier statements on the high cost of being a disciple. Following Jesus is not like a weekend where mom is away and the rules go out the window because dad's in charge. Following him is still a whole life commitment. You notice that even though Jesus says that the burden is light, you have to notice that there is still a load involved. There is still a burden involved. Jesus desires for his followers to be holy people devoted to obeying God and serving others. There is still stuff to do. There is a kingdom to advance, hurting people to be served, and truth to be proclaimed. There is still work to do. That's heavy. But Jesus lightens that burden. Jesus lightens that burden by coming alongside us and giving us the resources that we need to get the work done. You're not expected to change the world on your own. God has not put that burden on you. You're not expected to change the world on your own power. The same Holy Spirit who Jesus relied on for his ministry is available to anyone who will commit to him. The cost of discipleship is high, but Jesus gives his followers to carry the burden, and that's why he can say that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The simple fact is that he just wants us to follow him. The second way that we can lose sight of Jesus' call is to go to the exact opposite side of things. Instead of going and saying, well, Jesus says his burden is easy, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, so he doesn't expect anything of me. We can go and swing to the exact opposite side of the spectrum. And we can believe, like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, that the simplicity of the gospel is just too easy. There's got to be more to it. We can see the simplicity of the gospel message and think to ourselves, that can't possibly be it. And like the Pharisees, we might, make addition, we might make additions to what God has revealed and turn discipleship into a complex, intricate, confusing web of arbitrary rules. It's a heavy enough burden to carry on your own, and Jesus does not intend that for you. But there are two other things that can happen if we start to do that, if we start to turn following Jesus into this intricate, highly strict, arbitrary set of rules that we make for ourselves because we think that the gospel is too simple. First, we run the risk of burdening other people with things God never intended or wanted. We make these rules 
surrounding the gospel to make sure that, well, if you're going to be like us, you're going to look like us, and here's steps A, B, C, C1, C2, C3. Here's the rules of what it looks like to be one of us. We can overburden people with things God never wanted or intended. The second thing, the second thing that may happen is that we may start to judge others by the rules that we've made up for ourselves. They have what in their house? They do what as a family? They listen to you or watch that? Now, there are some pretty clear and distinct things that the Bible does instruct us to keep each other accountable on. By no means am I saying that there's no accountability within a church family. The Bible instructs us to keep each other accountable at staying true to the revealed gospel that God has given us. No additions, no subtractions, nothing but Scripture. Unity in the church. Stay accountable to that. Caring for people in need. Not taking advantage of others. But Jesus never made his followers the morality police. Romans 14 says not to argue or condemn fellow believers over non-essential things that the Spirit has not convicted them of. Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I think I've got it written out a little bit different up here. So let us stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. In other words, Commit to following God authentically in your own life, in your own heart, and trust that the Holy Spirit will convict others as needed. Show people what it looks like to follow God, and trust that the Holy Spirit will do His job of convicting. If someone is preaching a false gospel, or if somebody is causing division within the family of God, or if somebody is abusing people, absolutely, we will confront that. Otherwise, the Spirit's job is to convict us of the things that are going on in our lives. If the, Spirit show, if the Spirit shows you something that keeps you from obeying God, then you must remove it. If the Spirit shows you something that is keeping you from loving others well, serving, you must remove it. Otherwise, there's no need to heap additional burdens onto yourself or anyone else who desires to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is a lot simpler than sometimes we like to make it. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The call of Jesus is still work. Let's not lose sight of that. Taking up his yoke requires total commitment to his kingdom and his cause, and it will mean devoting your entire life to him. But he doesn't expect you to carry that burden on your own. Unlike the religious people who believe that salvation must be earned by following a complex and heavy set of rules. Jesus only requires us to love God and to love others. If there's anything that stops us from loving God well, if there's anything that stops us from loving our neighbor well, those things must be removed. But all he requires of us is to love God and to love others. Holiness is a high calling. But Jesus provides his followers with the resources to do the work he has called them to. And as we live in obedience to him, we discover that he makes the burden light. 
He provides rest from the heaviness of trying to earn salvation. There are no flow charts. There are no caveats. No hidden fees involved with being a disciple of Jesus. Following Jesus is refreshingly, mercifully, and beautifully simple. Let's pray. Lord God, as we close our time together, I want to ask God that by your Spirit you would show us any place where maybe we have maybe we have missed the point of what it is that you've called us to. God, while we desire to follow you with sincerity, God, while we love you with all of our hearts, that maybe Jesus, in our, in our desire to please you, maybe in our desire to make sure that we are doing what you've asked, God, maybe we have overburdened something. Maybe we have made an addition to you what you've asked us to do. Maybe we've taken something away. God, I want to ask that by your Spirit, you would reveal those things in our hearts. Trusting, Lord, that you are gentle and kind and merciful. And that as you remove those things, you lighten the burden by carrying our righteousness on yourself, by providing it for us. Pray, God, that as we go from this place, that each one of us would experience that freedom that comes from trusting that following you is as simple as loving you well, following your word, obeying your commands, and loving others. Pray, God, that you would show that to us today. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.